Jane Hansen, and this week in the arena, a cardinal raises the issue of celibacy and raises some eyebrows. Earlier this month, retiring New York Cardinal Archbishop Edward Egan caused a stir when he said in a radio interview that the church may revisit the issue of priests and mandatory celibacy. I think it's going to be looked at, the cardinal said. Well, it's something that we are going to look at right now. Joining us, Father Kieran Harrington, the Director of Communications for the Diocese of Brooklyn, Elizabeth Scalia, contributor to Inside Catholic and author of the blog The Anchorist, Grant Galicho, Associate Editor of Commonweal Magazine, and joining us on the telephone, a Catholic priest who is married. He's a former Episcopalian who converted and is allowed to be ordained under a special pastoral provision. He is Father Richard Chipola from the Diocese of Bridgeport in Connecticut, which is, of course, the very diocese that Cardinal Egan came from before he came to the Archdiocese of New York. Father Chipola, I'm going to start right with you. Tell me about the experience of being a married priest, because frankly, I've never met one. Well, um, being, being a married priest is, and um, uh, I say this with the understanding that, you know, uh, that I've always understood my priesthood as an exception, and that I'm a priest by the grace of God, and I will always be very, very thankful for that, but, but I've always understood this as, um, as an exception to the rule of well, I'd, I'd, celibacy. Yeah. I'd like to understand that a little bit better. Maybe mm -hmm. Father Harrington can, can just address this idea of the, the pastoral provision that I guess right. came from John Paul II. Right. Well, I mean, Father, uh, as you know, right, you, you, how long were you an Episcopalian priest for before? Uh, I, was, I was a priest for 11 years. Right. So, I mean, the pastoral provision is, is, is that uh, there are people who have come to the Catholic Church, uh, were members of the clergy in their own denomination. This is the way in which they made their living, lived their life, and the Church recognized uh, that, uh, that their calling uh, is no less valid uh, in, in, in the Catholic Church, and so they makes the provision then uh, for, the, for the minister to be ordained a priest and the Catholic Church and to function as a priest. And we're very grateful to have you uh, ministering among us and as a brother. So thank you, Father. Father, thank you. Uh, Father Cipolla, how is your wife treated? Do people think that it's strange for a priest to have a wife? Yes, they do, and and uh, even after even after twenty five years as a priest, uh, you know the introductions are always uh, you know quite odd, um, sort of awkward, and mm -hmm. and uh, um, uh, I think it's very difficult uh, for my wife, and and uh, um, you know. Uh, important uh, I think for you know for everyone to know at the outset that you know that I am that I am opposed uh, you know to the relaxation of because of the celibacy rule mm -hmm. and you and are yes oh uh, um, absolutely why uh, well um, <laughs> I don't think you will uh, you know like the answer but but uh, it uh, it's not because of my personal experience. Uh, my personal experience uh, sort of corroborates um, uh, what I believe from from a doctrinal way. Uh, I think that my personal experience is that um, that it's extremely difficult to be uh, to be fully priest and uh, at the same time uh, to be fully father. Um, to my children um, and a husband to my wife. Now, there's the argument that, you know, that a doctor uh, or, um, uh, is able to, you know, do everything that he does and his hours, of course, are very difficult. And these demands mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, on his time uh, keep him away from home uh, for a lot, but, but um, to me... It sounds um, like you're saying something like it's like more profound, that there's a sense of a divided heart. Absolutely, and, Father. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, to me, the purpose of priestly self is freedom. Mm. Uh, 
freedom in the image of Jesus Christ, not freedom in the image, of course, of the secular world. Right. And uh, I think that what I have seen in the 25 years or so as a Catholic priest and uh, as a Catholic is a secularization of the church, of the clergy, and and uh, uh, I would understand uh, uh, having 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 married priests as just one more step um, in the secularization process. Well, I have to tell you something, Father. That Grant here knows your daughter, and I'm curious, Grant. I'm sure that he does. From the <laughs> She's people, a very yeah. well-adjusted woman. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just curious of whether what if there have been conversations about her father oh, sure. being a priest and how she, you know. Const, it's constant gossip, Jane, I have to tell you. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, I, I, I guess it doesn't come up that much. Maybe when I first met Benna um, and I first learned that her, her dad is a, a Catholic priest, I, it, you know, it's not, there are only something like a hundred of you, right? 200, I believe. Is it 200? Yeah, there's 200. So it's, it's a pretty rare thing. Um, well, I mean, but but let's two hundred Catholic priests who've converted to who who right. are priests as a result the, of conversion. Right, that are part of this pastoral provision. provision. But I, I guess I'm curious about. She obviously grew up with her father as a Catholic priest, and I'm just curious about how that is talking with other kids and what goes on. And well, and you I'm know, just, we're we're in our thirties now, so uh, <laughs> yeah. setting up play dates is a, is a little different. Right, uh, but but, <laughs> but when but when when we do when when we do ch chat about it, it's you know it's the way Benna talks about it. If I can speak for her, uh, is is just like any other fact. You know, I grew up in a house, uh, you know, with two floors and a, an unfinished basement. It's it's it, it, it Benna doesn't think of it as this, you know oddity as, as far as I can tell. Father, maybe you can uh, address that. Is, is How is it that you are a priest to your wife, uh, to your daughter, to your, to your family members? I mean, it's a, you, you know, I know that for, for me it's unique. And, you know, my sister one time said, I want to go to confession. And I found <laughs> that it was kind of a weird experience. You uh, didn't do it, did you? Well, I heard her confession, yeah. yeah. What do you say <laughs> now? <laughs> what do you say now? But, um, but I, I think that, uh, but um, I think that, uh, that it's also possible, uh, you know, as how are you as a priest to your, um, how are you as a priest to your family? We've got, oh, only oh, got a short time to, oh, to okay. break. Well, so no, I, uh, you know, I think I can answer that. And, and uh, um, I do wish that uh, we weren't talking so much about uh, me as an individual. The, <laughs> sure. I, yeah, but, but no, but uh, you can, uh, yeah, I can answer that um, uh, fast. Uh, uh, Right after my ordination, or probably even before my ordination, uh, my wife and I decided that, you know, that they would always go to their own parish church here, and uh, and um, and and in fact, uh, in the 25 years, um, uh, except for the very recent past, um, um, they have all gone here to, you know, to. St. Thomas Aquinas, even though all these years um, I've been in Bridgeport, I've been in New Canaan, Darien, on and on and on. So, so, and 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 so that part of my ministry mm -hmm. ha, uh, has been quite separate, and mm -hmm. uh, we decided on that at the outset. And yeah, um, that and, that was probably a very important decision for yes, your family yes, at that point. Yes. Right. Okay, Father, hold on, hold on the line one second because sure. we're going to take a break. Sure. We'll be back in a moment yeah. and continue this conversation, so do stay with us. Welcome back as we continue our discussion on priests and celibacy. Elizabeth, you've been quietly listening to this conversation with Father Cipolla talking about his experience being a Catholic priest who's married. What, what is your reaction to what he's had to say? Well, I think it's interesting that he has doctrinal issues and, and um, as a married priest is thinking men uh, should kind of go along with what St. Paul said, uh, you know, which is if you can be single, be single. 
um, better to, to um, what was it, better, and if not, then marry, because it's better to marry than to burn. Um, I, I am kind of interested in the pragmatic, uh, the practical as applications of this. You know, how do we support priests and entire families in a parish monetarily? And, and so I'm interested in hearing more about his experience. Well, Father, can you, Father Chipola, can you address that? How, how has that part of it been? Yes, oh, yes, I can address that in many ways, but just let me tell you this uh, story, that, that uh, the week before my ordination in the parish church here, and, and, and my family and I had been attending there, and um, in the interim, in the two years, um, I became a Catholic in uh, 82, and I wasn't ordained until 84, so every Sunday, uh, We'd be there because a normal family, and uh, so the pastor told the congregation uh, in our presence, but he didn't say who, and he said that, you know, that, uh, you know, I, as a member of that parish, would be ordained, uh, you know, by the bishop, blah, 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 and he gave the whole history and everything. And this woman stood up, not pleased with the whole situation, and uh, I remember her saying, and would somebody tell me who's going to pay for his wife and his children? Ooh. And and uh, and I said to myself, hmm, all right. Now and and uh, uh, I, but I think that that was a very valid question. Mm -hmm. And it became quite clear that that uh, you know after I was ordained that I was expected to earn my own keep, and that was it. And however, I did that and. Uh, um, I am a teacher, and and uh, uh, so and so, I have taught, and uh, I've assisted, of course, in the uh, parishes, and and uh, um, I've assisted uh, to uh, not just sort of a weekend priest, but as so much as I can. But uh, uh, the point is that you know that in no way. Uh, was the diocese or the church um, uh, even e even vaguely thinking that that somehow I would be supported? Um, but why by, other priests yeah. are supported? I, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't that. think that that to me is not the most compelling argument. I think the uh, about the the financing because I mean that's something that can be worked out. To me, the compelling argument for celibacy is is I think the ascetical and the theological reasons uh, for celibacy, and, and I'm curious in, in terms of your own thinking, of how your, how your thinking on this issue has evolved. Okay, yeah, it's good. You know, uh, you know I uh, um, started that. Um, as an Episcopalian, as I said, I was sort of myself as, you know, as a minister, you know, who had high church tendencies <laughs> and, and uh, um, you know, and I worked in the parish in the day, uh, and I came home at night to my family, and, and uh, um, you know, that was it. When I discovered the, uh, the understanding of the Mass as the offering up of the sacrifice of the Son to the Father, mm -hmm. and the priest's uh, intimate identification right. with that, offering up, of course, of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. When I discovered, you know, the whole understanding of the priest at the altar, Christ. Christus, there at the altar, mm -hmm. uh, when I discovered the whole ascetical tradition, of course, of the priesthood uh, in the West, um, that is when, you know, I began to rethink my entire understanding of celibacy and and uh, you know and uh, uh, and, and uh, so how have you how have you captured that in your life as a as a married priest is this because you're you're spot on in terms of the connection I think the priest the sacrificial offering right that he is offering himself on the altar how how have you been able to uh, capture that in your life as a uh, as a priest. Great difficulty, mm -hmm. uh, with great <laughs> difficulty, and 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 uh, you know, I just want to go back, you know, uh, um, to what I said earlier. Um, you know, I am not free to die for my people, and that's the ultimate freedom of celibacy. 
mm-hmm. in. I think that it has to be said over and over again because otherwise the Catholic priesthood devolves into just a, uh, a religious type of a functionary who goes to, you know, church in the day and, and they come home at night. But that identification with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is just so central that, you know, uh, that I find it hard, you know, to, you know, to understand how, how we could have uh, uh, a married priest. But, but we do uh, have that, I mean, there is that tradition in the Eastern Church of a married, of a married priesthood. I, and all there, right. Yeah. Oh, but, uh, yes, yes, it's true, but, uh, a, but a very different culture, a very different uh, a type of a history. Very, very different, and and uh, you know, and and uh, um, Father, I am not an Easterner. Say... You know, I am not an Easterner. Father, I'm can I interrupt yes. you, Father? Father, yeah. Go yes. Ahead. Well, I'm thinking that you're describing something that's very mystical and and profoundly supernatural, and that is a, a wonderful identification, and, and I'm glad to hear it. And it also brings to the point the fact that the priesthood is profoundly supernatural and unnatural. Um, yes. As opposed to ministry in general, which is right. whether that be Protestant ministry or layperson's ministry or whatever. Um, I think that's a, a really valid point. And I think that when you start bringing in the Eastern churches, you are right. There's a very different culture there. Um, there's a very subservient mindset in terms of, say, the wife of an Eastern priest versus what the West might expect of a priest's wife. Yes. And um, I think you're absolutely true about that. Actually, right about that, Elizabeth. Father, we thank you so much for sharing your story with us and for giving us your thoughts today. Can um, I just say um, uh, one more thing, please? Absolutely. Sure. I just want to. I just want to say this. Um, um, I was very surprised by the cardinal's comment, and and um, I was very surprised for several reasons. But you know, but uh, I think that the. Uh, I think that the most important reason why I was surprised was he said this as a conclusion that, you know, uh, that he was so disappointed that he wasn't able to attract uh, uh, more men into the seminary. And and, uh, I see that um, as an illogical uh, type of a statement, you know, uh, to me, uh, from the good young men that I know who are thinking about the priesthood, uh, the problem is not celibacy. Yeah, I think uh, that I think that actually uh, I, I think that the cardinal's remarks may have been a little misrepresented, though. So I think that he, in, in the way he was speaking, uh, I think that it, it, I think there are li- there's a greater context, in, particularly in terms of the church law, that he was kind of addressing. Right. I don't think he was I don't think he was addressing it from the point of view. Of, uh, of solving the vocation crisis. Right. Father? Or, yeah, yeah, I realize that, but, but what I want to say is, is, you know, is that uh, it seems to me that the greatest uh, obstacle to, you know, to, to an increase in the vocations is, is we have to uh, have priests who, who are going to attract young men and, and, uh, um, Pope Paul VI talked about a virile asceticism. I would really emphasize both of those things. Yeah. We need priests who are men, uh, and uh, we need priests who who are willing to identify in a totally sacrificial way. Thank you thank so you. much for sharing that thought with us. We really, truly appreciate it, Father Well, Chicola. thank you so much. You're thank welcome. you, Father. Okay. We'll be back with some All final right. thoughts in just a moment. Welcome back to our discussion about priests and celibacy. I was so struck by the conflict that I felt coming from Father Chipola, trying to be both the husband and father and being a priest at the same time with even economic pressures. It just came searing through. Yes, he sounded very conflicted, and I felt bad. I felt bad for him. But this has been a 25-year, he's been a priest for 25 years. Push me, pull you, yeah. 
it, it's, um, I, I don't want to say it's an unfortunate situation because obviously he's raised a family and, and it, it's been probably, I'm sure, a, a fairly satisfying life. But I, I can't imagine living with that kind of t dynamic tension for 25 years. And I, I'm not surprised hearing him uh, describe that life to, to hear him say that doctrinally he is against married priests. Which I was really kind of surprised by. Mm. I, I didn't expect him to say that. I did. <laughs> but that's only because I know of him through his daughter. Um, yeah, I, don't, I guess I didn't get conflictedness from him. Um, I think he's a very, from what I know of him, he's a very thoughtful guy. And I, I got the sense that he was trying to choose his words carefully, which as an editor is something I really appreciate. Right. I'm, I, I have no doubt that, I mean, I, he genuinely describes that tension. And that is a serious problem for, for, for these guys. I, what, I don't know how they this, do it. What about this question? I mean, typically people reduce uh, celibacy to a question of simply a church discipline, simply something that has taken okay. place as a, as a result of historical uh, considerations. I mean, Father Ed speaks to a spiritual dimension to celibacy, which I think is very often underrepresented in the public discourse. Well, until the 11th century, priests, bishops, had they could have wives if they wanted them. Right. I mean, and there is this uh, there is this question about, you know, what is the notion of celibacy? Where does it come from? And 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 I think that it's important to realize is that, uh, you know, celibacy is not something like the church picked up in the 12th century and said now we're going to have a celibate clergy. It was a, it was actually a part of the ascetical tradition throughout the uh, th from the beginning of the inception of the church. I mean, the notion originally starts as this notion of white martyrdom, right? That where uh, Christians were originally called to spill their blood for their faith. Uh, and so once there ceased to be the sense of persecution, how is it that one can capture the notion of martyrdom? And one of the ways was, was this a white martyrdom, it's a celibate life to give everything up for Jesus Christ, uh, to show that our, we stake our claim not in this world here, but in the life which is to come. And, and the most evident way we do that is by not having children, not having progeny, those who follow after us. Well, too, and there was also the whole idea of belonging totally to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I mean, look, when we look at virgin martyrs, uh, we, they get looked down as, oh, the virgin martyrs. And, uh, you know, they, they get looked at as prissy uh, little women. Well, no, they were very tough women who said, I'm not going to be somebody's chattel. I'm not going to be somebody's wife. You're not going to sell me off for a land deal. Sure. I belong to Jesus. I am myself, my own person in Christ, and this is how I'm going to live my life. So back then, those declarations were extremely powerful because it was freedom. It was another way of living that was completely outside of what society expected. It was radical. You know, I think that the issue is uh, very often uh, the question of celibacy comes up as the solution to the uh, to the shortage of priests. And and from my perspective, and something that I think Father was addressing, is is that what really is occurring in the church is a crisis of spirituality in the priesthood and a crisis in terms of the priestly identity, in terms of the radical living out of the priestly life. You know, I would not be someone who espouses a, uh, a married clergy as a way to solve the uh, solve the question of the shortage of priests because I don't think it really does. I mean, you take a look at the Episcopalian Church or you take a look at the Presbyterian all of Church, the churches, they all have problems. They're all having problems. But what now, I think it, the shortage for us should point the way to is rethinking particularly diocesan priesthood in the, in the lived experience of diocesan priesthood, the spiritual life that's, uh, that surrounds uh, diocesan priesthood, because there is no question that uh, the way that this life is being lived now is, uh, is, is problematic and perhaps in some places very dysfunctional. Right. Yeah, I guess one of the things that I'd like to know more about, I, I, I need to do some reading, but the Eastern churches, as we mentioned in the, the last act, we, they do this. I mean, the, the Orthodox Church do, does this. I know a couple of married Orthodox priests, um, and they they have it set up so that you can't be ordained um, with. Uh, the, I, I, if you want to have a wife, you cannot get uh, ordained um, before marriage. So, is there any way yeah. that yeah. the Catholic they don't Church want dating priests? Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's a much. It's not because they don't want dating priests. The, <laughs> no, the that, issue, that's part no, of no, it. No, no, no. The, there is a, the, there is the a theological <laughs> reason here, which is that you don't put any sacrament above priesthood in terms of you don't layer on a sacrament of ministry. Right there are sacraments of ministry, marriage, and holy orders, and you can't lay over uh, the the sacrament of ministry 
of holy orders. And that, that's really the question because it gets to what Father was saying is the, the question of a divided heart. Do you know yeah. what's really interesting here though, and this sort of didn't really come up last week when we were talking about vocations, but we stop, uh, we don't think enough about the fact that marriage itself is a vocation. It's the same sort of vocation. It's the call to love and the call to self-sacrifice. And you know, it's very difficult to be completely self-immolating in a relationship such as marriage and then be self-immolating again in the priesthood. These are very separate and very distinct and very um, absolute vocations. Well, that is going to be our final word because this obviously is a subject that will continue to be discussed throughout this diocese, throughout dioceses across America. Grant, thank you. Elizabeth, Father Harrington, and thank you again for being with us. And you don't need a television to watch the net. We are always on online at www.netny.net. For all of us here, I'm Jane Hansen. I'll see you next time in the arena.